Good evening, everyone. I'm Professor Andres Velendowski, Head of School of Mathematics and Physics at the University of Lincoln. And very warm welcome to everyone who uh, came this uh, night to listen to our uh, Our Astra chart. We are uh, joined here as usual with uh, by Professor Don Kurtz, uh, who is in uh, uh, South Africa. Uh, we uh, had a bit of one minute delay because Don was without electricity, but now he's with electricity, so everything is connected. Uh, so uh, uh, apologies for slight delay. Uh, I think now echo disappeared. So, uh, John Levenhall, is, is it uh, is it the case? Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So, uh, we are ready to start. Uh, again, very warm welcome everyone who came. Uh, I just remind that uh, we have light chart running. So everyone who has questions, uh, uh, could you please uh, type your questions? Uh, and then at the end of a uh, uh, presentation of Dawn, which is about half of our time, uh, we will try to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, it is our uh, 13th Astro chart. Um, and uh, uh, Many of you came before. Uh, I see names uh, of um, our permanent uh, uh, attendees. Uh, uh, I see, for instance, AC from San Diego, very uh, warm welcome. Uh, and I just will say a few words about Dawn. Um, as uh, um, some of you might be new in this uh, uh, virtual room. Uh, Dawn is uh, uh, originally from San Diego. Um, he uh, uh, received his uh, undergraduate and, uh, and postgraduate education in uh, uh, United States. And after um, a short uh, span as postdoc, then spent another quarter of a century working in South Africa, um, uh, which followed with another quarter of a century uh, here in the United Kingdom in the University of Central Lancashire. Uh, right now, uh, Dawn is a Professor Emeritus at the University of Central Lancashire, and he is also um, an extraordinary professor in Northwest University, South Africa, where he is uh, physically right now. Uh, we are also very uh, fortunate and pleased uh, um, that Dawn is our uh, visiting professor of astrophysics here at the University of Lincoln. Um, and, and those who uh, might attend our uh, public lectures uh, uh, before pandemic uh, might remember Don giving these uh, lectures uh, live uh, uh, here in Lincoln. Um, we already meet with Don and 13 times, and this uh, 13 times in this virtual room, talk about various uh, uh, astronomical things. Uh, Don is uh, a part of, uh, uh, of conducting a wide range of research in astrophysics uh, and being co-author of a now classical book on astroseismology also delivers public talks uh, all over the planet. Uh, in fact, as I know, there is only one continent left uh, where Don uh, did not give yet uh, his lecture. This Antarctica, uh, if I if I if I'm correct, uh, for for his services to um, uh, to um, Astronomy Astrophysics, Dawn uh, was awarded uh, Royal Astronomical Society Service Award uh, 2022. And with this uh, uh, few words introduction, I'm very happy to give floor to Dawn uh, for his presentation. Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, good evening, everyone who is uh, tuning in from England, of course, AC in San Diego, and those of you in the United States who've come in, good day to you and probably good night to anybody who's come in from the Far East. This evening, finally, this is 13th of the Astro Chats. I'm actually going to tell you about the kind of research I do for myself. Um, Andre just alluded to that slightly, 
and I will take you through that this evening with the songs of the stars, the real music of the spheres. And we'll start by going back 2,500 years to a name I'm sure you're all familiar with, Pythagoras, originally from Samos. Later in his life, he immigrated to Croton off the southern tip of Italy, where he founded the Pythagorean Brotherhood. And they were natural scientists. Um, you probably remember the name of Pythagoras from the formula for the sides of a right triangle, a triangle with a 90 degree angle in it, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, Pythagorean theorem. But the Pythagoreans also were trying to figure out how the universe worked. And on your left there, you see an artistic impression of their view of the universe. The earth was at the center. Excuse me for a moment, I've lost my laser pointer. Let me bring it back. The earth was at the center of the universe for them. And then above the earth on crystal spheres were the moon, Mercury, Venus, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the stars. And they moved in the sky from the point of view of humans because these crystal spheres spun. And as they spun, they made a humming sound. And that humming sound was the music of the spheres. The gods could hear the music of the spheres, and so could humans who were something more than normal humans, humans like Pythagoras. His followers considered him to be superhuman, and he could hear the music of the spheres. Now, you'll see from his dates there, he lived to a good age. And you can also tell from Andre's introduction to me and my quarters of centuries here and there, I'm getting to a good age myself. And I can tell you now I understand that Pythagoras wasn't actually hearing the music of the spheres. Pythagoras had tinnitus uh, ringing in his ears coming from his mind, is my guess. Now, Pythagoras's idea of the music of the spheres resonated in European thought and then down through the millennia for all of human thought. A century after Pythagoras, the great Greek philosopher Plato said that a siren sits on each planet who carols a most sweet song agreeing to the motion of our own particular planet, but harmonizing with all the others. That idea was so strong that 2,000 years later, the great German astronomer physicist, Johannes Kepler, when he was trying to understand how the planets move around the sun, and he had a, a heliocentric view of the universe with the sun at the center of the universe, he was trying to understand the motions of the planets around the sun, and he wanted to understand their periods, how long they took get in comparison to how far they were from the sun in a harmonic notation because of the music of the spheres. And those little musical notations that I'm showing on the lower left there actually come from Johannes Kepler's publications. One of the things that made him such a great scientist is he tried to do that for many, many years. And when he eventually failed, he gave up on his cherished idea of the music of the spheres. He went back to scratch and he figured out Kepler's laws of motion of the planets around the sun. And those are still correct and we use them to this day. So that's what made Kepler great is that he gave up the idea of the music of the spheres. And with that, the idea of the music of the spheres in science died for 400 years. It's back and that's what the talk's about tonight. But from Kepler until the time I was an undergraduate student in San Diego 50 years ago, the music of the spheres was only in the arts. And of course, Kepler's contemporary put it in the arts you can find just about anything in Shakespeare. Here's a quote from the Merchant of Venice when the young Lorenzo, who's um, courting the merchant's daughter, Jessica, says to her, there's not the smallest orb which thou beholdest, but in his motion like an angel sings, still choiring to the young-eyed young -eyed cherubim. So Shakespeare had the music of the spheres in this play, and it remained in the arts and in literature and is still there for the following hundreds of years. It's now back in science. And it's back as the field of astroseismology. You should be hearing a sound there in the background. And that is the sound of a pulsating red giant star. The stars do have sounds in them. And I've just played you the sound of one of those stars. And I'll make that real for you as we talk about this over the coming slides. In 2010, two of my colleagues, uh, Professor Connie Arts from Leuven University in Belgium, Professor Jorn Christensen Delsgor from Aarhus University in Denmark, and I published the fundamental textbook in this field, Astroseismology. This book's 866 pages long. 
It weighs a kilogram and a half. Uh, it's a pretty hefty tome. And I can assure you the first, first six pages are completely readable for anybody. Uh, I wrote that introductory chapter and the talk you're getting tonight is basically at the level of those first six pages. After that, if you'd like to continue with the book, you need to be a bit more mathematically oriented, interested in the physics. Um, just two months ago, we're in November, in September, um, Professors Arts and Christians Delsgore were awarded the Cobley Prize in physics for astroseismology. They both built very big groups and supervised dozens and dozens of students, and they're very influential. The Cobley Prize, if you haven't heard of it, is comparable to the Nobel Prize. And so they got a gold medal from the King of Norway and a share of a million dollars for that prize. It's a big deal. Uh, in my case, my wife and I were invited to Oslo in Norway to go to the King's Banquet and for me to present to the public this field. And that's just what I'm doing you here with you here tonight in a rather shorter version than what I presented in Oslo last September. So this field is now widely recognized with this big prize internationally in physics. Last year, I wrote over nine months a complete review of the field observationally, and that was also just published in September in this well-known journal, Annual Review of Astronomy and Astrophysics. Now you're looking at a picture now of what appears to be a photograph of the sky of the constellation Orion. It's actually a computer generated image by my colleague and friend from Hungary, uh, Professor Zoltan Kolat. And he's used data from telescopes that measure the distance to the stars to put into this picture um, computer generated images of all the stars. And so what you're looking at here, here's Betelgeuse, the big red giant in the shoulder of Orion, Bellatrix in the other shoulder. Mintaka, Alnilam, and Alnitak in the belt of Orion. There's the sword. Rigel in one thigh, Scythe in the other. And then the belt of Orion points off to the brightest star in the sky, Sirius over here, and up to the bright red giant Aldebaran in the face of the bull in Taurus up there. Every single star in this picture is a real star in the galaxy. And what Zoltan did was he's programmed in the computer so that we can take a trip to the belt of Orion now at 200 million times the speed of light. And I'm going to start this for you in a moment, but I want you to notice two major things. One is that even at 200 million times the speed of light, the stars do not go whizzing by. This isn't like in Star Wars and Star Trek, where in Star Trek you get up to warp 10 and the stars go flying by. This is of course completely unphysical. We can only do it in the computer, but even at 200 million times the speed of light, the stars are a long, long, long way away. And the other thing I'd like you to notice is almost all the stars coming towards you will be little tiny dots in this picture because the vast majority of stars are much, much smaller than the sun. They're what we call little red dwarfs. And so let's take this trip to the belt of Orion. That very strange music you're listening to is a composition by the Hungarian composer named Jena Koiler. He worked with Zoltan Kolat to do that. Every single instrument in that orchestra you were listening to is a real star. They've used the sounds from the stars. Now, we humans are very visual creatures. For you and I, seeing is believing. But there are other ways to know the world. You know, when I was a student in Texas, uh, Texas has a lot of limestone. There are many caves, and one of our sports was to go caving. And we wouldn't go caving during the day when it was sunny. We'd go kayaking on the river. We'd go rock climbing. We'd go swimming. And then as it got dark, we'd go into the cave, where it's dark anyhow. And as we were going into the caves, the bats were coming out by their thousands and even tens of thousands. And yet, they weren't seeing us through their eyes in the darkness. They were using echolocation. And they never hit us. They didn't hit each other. They get out into the dark. They can catch mosquitoes, these tiny insects. They can dip down to the river and have a drink. You know, as you look at that picture on your computer right now, the light's entering your eye. It's being focused by your lens onto your retina. 
The energy is absorbed by your retina and it's turned into an electrochemical signal that passes down your optic nerve to the part of your brain that interprets vision. And you've got this movie theater running in your mind. I do too. That's us seeing the world. And yet as I talk to you now, my voice is creating vibrations. Those vibrations are pushing your eardrum in and out. And the energy from that's being turned into an electrochemical signal, the same kind of signal that passes down your optic nerve. As in the case of your ears, it passes to another part of your brain and you hear me. But for you and for me, hearing and seeing are very different experiences. Now, you can't get in the mind of another creature, but I'm willing to bet if you could get in the mind of those bats that echolocate, they've got a movie theater running in their mind. They know where everything in their environment is, but the information comes from sound. And so one of the take home messages tonight is you can see with sound. Now, we humans know how to do that. We do it in hospitals for medical reasons. Here is the 3D printing of the face of a fetus before it's born where ultrasound, high frequency sound has been passed from different directions through the mother to be's abdomen. And then that sound is processed in a computer. And with the computer, we make a model of the baby's head. And we used to make pictures of that. That's very nice because we're visually oriented, but for a mother to be who's uh, partially sighted or has no sight, how does she see her baby? Well, now we use a 3D printer and we print the face of the baby. And so there's a model of the baby's face where the information came from sound. And that's exactly what I and my colleagues do with the stars. There are sounds in the stars. Those can't get out. I'll tell you how we actually hear them, if I can use that term. But we use those sounds to model the inside of the star. And I can see the inside of the sun in more detail than you can see the face of that baby now using the sounds that penetrate the sun. So sound is a pressure wave. And this graphic you're looking at here, these little black dots are to represent the molecules in the air you're breathing right now. You're breathing a combination of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% argon, a little bit of carbon dioxide, water vapor, some other gases. And at the standard temperature and pressure that we've got in the rooms we're in, sound moves at 343 meters per second. And so as those molecules bump into each other, the sound wave travels through the air and it pushes your eardrum in and out. Now, the speed of sound depends on how hot the gas is, because the hotter it is, the faster these molecules move, and the faster they move, the faster the sound can move. On the other hand, at a given temperature, if you changed gas, if you had a lighter gas, then let's use the example of helium, the second lightest gas there is, you know and I know, I strongly suspect you've done it or you've seen it done. If I took a lung full of helium, say, out of a child's party balloon and then started speaking to you with helium in my lungs, my voice would go up by about a factor of three and I would sound a little bit like Donald Duck or Mickey Mouse. The reason is that the helium being very light to carry the same energy has to move much faster and so the speed of sound is faster. So the important thing here is that stars are made of gas. And once we measure the speed of sound through the star, we now have a measure of the temperature. That temperature then tells us what the pressure is, what the density is. And because it depends on the chemical composition, we now know the chemical composition structure of the star. We can figure out the interior view of the star by measuring the sound speed. Now, human hearing has a range of about 30 cycles per second. We call that a Hertz after the German physicist up to 18,000 cycles per second or 18,000 hertz for young people. Now, I know there are at least a few young people listening in. And for those of you who are still in your teens, into your 20s, you can hear up to about 18,000 cycles per second. It's a very high squeal. The older people amongst us, that includes Andre there and me, we've lost a lot of our high frequency hearing. We can still hear the bass, but we don't hear the high frequency so well. And so in England, a man invented a device called the mosquito, which is a teenager repellent. It's just out of the range of an adult's hearing. It lets out a squeal. And it, as he says here, it only bothers people under the age of about 25. Uh, the maker of this thing designed it so that shopkeepers who are in neighborhoods where the kids maybe don't have the best behavior could put this outside the shop and it would drive the kids away, but the adults would still count, come shopping. It's, of course, controversial. This is prejudicial against young people. Uh, not all young people are badly behaved. It's not fair. 
But the builder of this device said the sound's not loud or painful, just highly annoying. And for some for some teenagers, that's a good description of a teenager. Now, bats that echolocate. Now, here's a picture of one of the many species of leaf, leaf-nosed bats. Um, my passion was biology before I became an astronomer, and I think this bat's actually beautiful. It's evolutionarily so well designed. This bat lets out a loud scream, and it focuses the sound with this reflector on its nose here. And then the echo from the sound bouncing off of objects comes back to these giant ears, and the bat processes that sound in its head and probably has this movie theater running in its mind because it knows where everything in the environment is. It echolocates at very high frequency, much higher than we can hear. We only hear the low frequency end of the bat's chirps. The high frequency gives it better resolution. But if you could hear the bat, you could capture that sound and then bring it down into the audible. And so now sound has got three main characteristics to it. In physics, we would call that frequency, amplitude, and phase. In music, we would call that the pitch, how loud the note is, and when it starts. Those are the same concepts in music and in physics. And so with instrumentation that can hear the sound of the bat, we capture that. And then with our computers, we do a key change. Now, this is just like a key change in a composed piece of music. All that's happened in the key change is the conductor may choose to start on a different note than the composer composed the music for. That means starting on a different frequency, but we keep the ratios of all the frequencies the same, and so all the harmonies stay the same. And for the vast majority of us who do not have perfect pitch, a key change is still the same piece of music. That's what we've done with this bat sound. Now I'm about to play for you what the bat would sound like if you could hear 50,000 cycles per second. It's actually pretty awful, and it's much louder than the computer can generate. Thankfully, we cannot hear those bats in their full volume. We're not very good at sharing the environment with things that we don't like and that annoy us. So there's a bat which has a frequency too high for us to hear. We've done a key change and brought it down into the audible. This next animal I'm going to play for you is a blue whale. The blue whales are the largest animals that have ever lived on this planet. They're much bigger than even the biggest dinosaur or, or um, sea reptile that ever lived back at, the, back at the time of the dinosaurs. And the blue whales can let out a sound at the loudest. They can put out a sound just outside of them that is about 186 decibels. Now, 120 decibels is the loudest sound you and I can listen to without having ear damage. 180 decibels is a million times louder than that. And the consequence of that is that a whale can talk from a whale in the Antarctic and a whale in the Arctic can actually talk to each other all the way across the planet by putting out these incredibly loud sounds. Let's listen to the deep below our hearing level warning call of a blue whale. Now, again, we've recorded that with instrumentation sonar that can pick up the low frequencies of the whale. And then we've done a key change and boosted it into the audible so you and I can hear it. Now, if you can believe that's what a whale would sound like if you had the deep hearing to pick up those low frequencies, then likewise, when I play you sounds from the stars, as I did with that composition on the trip to Orion, those sounds from the stars are too deep for you to hear, but we can move them into the audible. And for fun, we listen to them possibly even eventually to do some science by maybe being able to pick up new things by listening instead of seeing. But my science is done in the computer with the sounds, and I'll explain that to you. If we look at a one-dimensional oscillator, and this graphing here is to represent a string oscillating up and down. This could be a string on my guitar, or this could be a string on your violin or cello if you play those instruments. If the string is oscillating up and down in its main mode, that's a word with an M, its main mode, that's the fundamental mode, here it is going up and down. But on my guitar, if I pull it out and I just touch the string exactly in the middle, that's the 12th fret, and I pluck it, one side goes down while the other side goes up, that's called the first overtone mode, and that little point in the middle that doesn't move is called a node, and that has twice the frequency of the fundamental, and that's one octave up. 
You can also have nodes with two nodes on the string and three and four. I'm not showing them all of them to you, but those have frequency ratios of two to one, three to two, four to three. And in Western music, we consider that to be harmonic. And we build our entire musical system off those low harmonics of an oscillating one dimensional oscillator in case of stringed instruments like these. Now, Here's another one-dimensional oscillator that many of you are familiar with. AC in San Diego, for you, this is a baseball bat. For all of you in Lincoln or in the UK, this is a cricket bat. And bats have got natural oscillation frequencies. They're built so that all the nodes on the bat come together for all the oscillation frequencies at a point here about two-thirds of the way along the barrel. The handle's down here on the right. And those of us who played baseball or cricket know well that if we want to hit the ball, if you're going to hit it for six in cricket or hit a home run in baseball, you want to hit it in that sweet spot right there. If you hit it right on the tip of the bat, and those of you who play have had that experience, it sets the bat to vibrating. And that then sets the handle down here into even bigger vibrations. And you'll feel the buzz in your hand, sometimes so strongly it actually tears the bat right out of your hand. So there's another kind of oscillation. Everything in the universe has the potential to oscillate. I want you to imagine now, you're looking at your screen, you can see this slide, but imagine uh, that in front of you is a symphony orchestra and they're about to tune up for a concert tonight. There the oboe. The oboe is just played with a 440 hertz, 440 cycles per second. And now all of the instruments are tuning up on exactly that same frequency. And even though every instrument's playing exactly the same note, you could hear the oboe, you can hear the violin, you can hear the French horn, you can hear the trombone, you can hear the bassoon. How is it that you can listen to all those instruments in the orchestra playing exactly the same note, and yet they sound different? What gives a musical instrument its timbre? Well, the answer's in these plots in the top of the diagram. On the left, here's a plot of the pressure wave that's coming to your ear versus time. And this is a simple sinusoidal wave. Now, if that's all an instrument produced, a musical instrument, that's very boring. That's a very um, electronic sounding sound. On the right hand side is a diagram that I know and love well. We've used a mathematical technique called a Fourier transform, and we've converted the pressure wave against time into frequency versus how loud the sound is. And in this case, there's only one sound and there's how loud it is. But now the instrument is capable of producing overtones at twice the frequency, three, four, five, six times. And the instrument is designed to do that differently for different instruments. And when it does that, it excites these overtones to different loudness. And when you add them all together back here in the time domain, the pressure goes up sharply and then lets out more linearly. And so your eardrum isn't just smoothly going in and out, it's being shoved in and then let out along this line and then shoved in again. And each of the musical instruments is designed to have a shapeless structure to give a different pattern in this diagram of frequency versus how loud the sounds are. This is what we use in the stars in order to model them and look inside diagrams like this. I will show you one. Now for musical instruments, they can oscillate in two dimensions too, unlike the string. Drums are the great example of that. And so here's a drum on the left oscillating in its fundamental mode, just the middle going up and down. The drum can have a node, a circle around that doesn't move, and there's its first overtone. It can have a second overtone with two circles that don't move, two nodes. But being two dimensional, it can have nodes in another direction. It can have a line across the drum that doesn't move. This is called a dipole mode. It can have two lines and what's called a quadrupole mode. It can also have circles in the radial modes and lines in the non-radial modes that oscillate like this. And the frequency ratios for drums are something like 137 to 72 and 443 to 212. And they're not simple ratios like two to one, three to two, four to three. And so drums go boom, cymbals go crash. They're not particularly harmonic. 
If we move to three dimensions, the stars can oscillate in three different directions. The simplest mode is called a radial mode where the star just swells and contracts spherically symmetrically as in this graphic. The color change is indicating a temperature change. Now stars do this and when we watch them do it, they're getting bigger and smaller, hotter and cooler. And so we see them getting brighter and dimmer. That's what we can observe as their brightness changes. The stars being three dimensional can have nodes which are lines of latitude in these dipole modes. And here's a simple dipole mode where the equator stays put. The temperature changes in the northern hemisphere opposite the southern hemisphere. The star wiggles up and down in space. But it can also have nodes that are lines of longitude, and that produces these rotating modes. And it's these rotating modes that allow us to look down deep inside stars like the sun and see what direction the winds are blowing under the surface and how the inside rotates and how much energy that carries and how that affects the entire life of the star from birth to death and the energy transport inside. One more set of examples. This is now the next kind of non-radial mode for stars called a quadrupole mode where there are two nodes on the surface at latitudes plus and minus approximately 30 degrees. And the stars, excuse me, the stars poles swell up while the equator contracts and the star stretches like this. Now stars really do this. This is an exaggerated amplitude, but they really do change shape like this. We can have the so-called tesseral modes here where they're both lines of latitude and longitude that are nodes. And we can have the so-called sectoral modes running with the rotation. And so these are the kinds of things that we who do this identify and use to model the inside of the star. So is this what I do as an astroseismologist, get out under the sky with a big ear and listen to the stars? And the answer is definitely no. The sounds cannot get out of the star. Remember the sounds are compression waves. Something has to be compressed and the star is the gas. But when the pressure wave gets to the surface, it cannot get out into a vacuum. The vacuum's empty. And so what we actually do is we watch the star get brighter and dimmer. The light comes to us. And from that, we can reconstruct the sounds. Now, you're very experienced with this exact process. When you take out your phone and you call your husband, your wife, your mother, your father, your friend, you talk into the phone and we turn your voice into an electrical signal. We then use that to turn that into a microwave. And a microwave is just long wavelength light. And we transmit that long wavelength light up to towers who are transmitting telephone conversations. The microwaves get to your contact's telephone, come down to the telephone where they're absorbed and turned back into electrical signal. And we use that to drive the speaker. And when you talk to your friend, your husband, wife, your mother, your father, their voice comes out of your phone. It sounds just like them. And that's what we're doing with the stars. The light comes to us, not as microwaves, but visible light. And from that, we can reconstruct those sounds with every bit as much fidelity as your phone can re reconstruct the voices of the people you know and you talk to on the phone. And so to do that, we now use space missions. My work is with this space mission, which is now over the Kepler mission, which orbited the sun. And now we're currently working with the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. It's active right now. Its primary job is to discover planets around other stars. And between Kepler and TESS and ground-based work, we now know of over 5,000 planets orbiting other stars. But it does that by measuring the stellar brightness to exquisite precision so it can see when a planet passes in front of the star. And that then lets us astroseismologists get the light and study the stars. And it's very important for the people hunting for planets because we can use that to tell how big the star is, what its mass is, and that then tells us what kind of a planet we're looking at. So here's actually the data as I see them. This top diagram is called a light curve. This is from the Kepler mission. And although the Kepler mission observed for four years, I've only plotted 100 days of data here so you can see some of the details. So this is 100 days of observations of a single star out of the 200,000 the Kepler mission looked at. This is how bright the star is and it's changing in parts per thousand. And you can see the star has waves in it going up and down and there are many of them so they're beating against each other. Now, if any of you are surfers, AC in San Diego, you might be. I was just out along the beach today watching the surfers not far from my house and they sit and they wait until a good set 
comes, they will say. And that's because there are multiple waves in the ocean. And when they pile on top of each other, you get a big set. You get good, high, big waves. And then they go out of phase and one wave cancels the other and it drops again. Well, this is happening in the star. And on the bottom is that plot where we're plotting for musical sound, how loud it is versus the frequency. And in the case of the star, you can see there are many, many, many different frequencies. And we use those to model the inside of the star, just like that baby's face was modeled with the ultrasound in the hospital scan for the mother-to-be I showed you earlier. Now, there's a kind of variable called a Cepheid variable. The brightest one is delta, the fourth brightest star in the constellation Cepheus. They're very important in astronomy. And it was discovered uh, more than a century ago, I'll explain that to you in a moment, um, that these Cepheids can be used to measure distances. Now, again, Zoltan Kolat, uh, my Hungarian uh, colleague and friend who's very good with his animations and music, has programmed one of these Cepheid variables with swells and contracts, spherically, symmetrically, like the model I showed you earlier. He's programmed a horn in his computer, and here's a visual image of it, to have the frequency response of a Cepheid variable, not of a violin, not of a cello, not of an oboe, not of a trombone or a flute, but instead of a star, and he's programmed this horn to play a Bach prelude. And so here's Bach, as you've never heard him before, where the instrument playing Bach is a star. Well, I hope you find that remarkable. Let me show you what we can do with these Cepheids. They're famous because Henrietta Leavitt in 1908 discovered what we call the period luminosity relationship. She discovered, she said it's worthy of notice the brighter variables have the longer periods. What that means is the big giant stars have very slow sound speed because they've got a low density and a slow sound speed and the sound has to travel very far to go from the surface to center. So the big stars play bass and they're the bright ones and the smaller stars play higher frequency sounds and they're less bright. And so with this discovery, which we now call the Levitt Law, here she is as a young woman at Harvard University, and here she is um, when she was famous later in life. That law was used 10 years after she discovered it by Edwin Hubble, after whom the Hubble Space Telescope was named, to show that these fuzzy patches in the sky that have got a spiral shape are not little gas clouds in our galaxy, which at that time was thought to be the whole universe, but they were instead other galaxies like the Milky Way. He proved that in 1923, when in this diagram in the lower right, this picture, it's a picture of the sky taken with photographic plates with the biggest telescope in the world at that time, and a 2.5 meter or 100 inch Hooker telescope on Mount Wilson, just above Pasadena in the Los Angeles area. He would have exposed this picture for 12 hours to get this. And there's the Andromeda galaxy taken with a photographic plate. He's noted 6th of October, 1923, up here between these two lines, he's put B-A-R exclamation point. He discovered one of these Cepheid variables. And from the work of Henrietta Leavitt and her period luminosity relationship, he then showed that this Andromeda galaxy, he thought at that time was a million light years away. We now know it's more than 2 million light years away. But the important thing is, Human's view of the universe just expanded overnight to know that this galaxy was another galaxy of hundreds of billions of stars like our own Milky Way. In this picture, here's a ground-based modern picture of that same galaxy. Look how much better it is. And from that little box right there where Hubble's variable Cepheid was, there's the Hubble Space Telescope picture there. And look at the stars by their millions you can see with the Hubble Space Telescope compared to this best picture possible only a century before. So how does this astroseismology work? And here's the answer. This is a cutaway of a star. Here's the surface. There's the center. And these are rays of sound waves. So here's a sound wave, a sound wave traveling down into the star. But as it goes down into the star, the temperature goes up and the speed of sound goes up. So the bottom of the wave is traveling faster than the top. And the wave is refracted back to the surface where it can't get out. And it bounces around inside the star. This particular wave going to that depth. This one with many more nodes penetrating more shallowly. 
In the case of the sun, we can see two million different modes penetrating to all different depths, and that allows us to map out the interior structure of the sun in exquisite detail. Now, here's a computer graphic from a supercomputer, a Cray computer. Uh, the original movie of this was two terabytes. This one's been reduced to a gigabyte, so I can get it into my computer. And this is a calculation, just a physics calculation, but it's showing you what one of these pulsating stars would look like if it were pulsating like the sun, if you could get up close. Now, this has been sped up. The actual period of this thing swelling and contracting would be more like 45 minutes. The red and the blue are representing temperature changes. And here's the sound of that star, which you were listening to before. That's a pulsating red giant. Now, you must be asking yourself, why do stars have sounds in them? And before I answer that, did you know that the Earth has sounds in it? The Earth has major sounds that penetrate through the whole planet after a big earthquake. And that's what allows a geoseismologist to tell you what the interior structure of the Earth is like, that it has an iron core, that the outer iron core is molten, the inner iron core is solid and has a temperature of 6,000 degrees, that the above the molten core, we then have the mantle. That information comes from sound waves penetrating the Earth, and they come from earthquakes. So this graphic will make that clear to you. Here we've gone back to 2011, February. And at that time, each one of these little circles represents an earthquake of 4.5 magnitude or larger. That's certainly big enough to feel. Um, by February, there had been 838 already that year in Japan. And as we watch, each one of these, the larger the circle, the bigger the earthquake. I hope you found that scary. That was a magnitude nine earthquake, about as big as they get. I was 10 floors up in my office at the University of Tokyo, where for years I would go there regularly to work with my colleagues there. And after hours outside watching the building swaying back and forth, the ground rumbling and shaking under our feet and everything waving back and forth, we were allowed briefly back into the building. This is what my office looked like when I got back in to grab my computer, get back out again, things tumbling down. So those sound waves traveled through the earth for a month after that earthquake. And using those sound waves, the seismologists can see inside the Earth. So why do the stars have sounds? The stars can't have earthquakes. There is no Earth. The stars are entirely made of gas. There's a nice picture of the sun I took off the north coast of Norway a few years ago at midnight. As it turns out, there's the midnight sun. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's the sun as you and I know it, just this glowing ball in the sky. But, oh, it is so much more interesting than that. Here is a view of the surface of the sun taken with the Solar Dynamics Observatory telescope in space. This particular movie I'm about to show for you, show to you, shows the limb of the sun where a flare has just gone off on the sun. So this is like a gigantic storm. The magnetic field on the sun has been stretched and twisted until it's snapped and it's reconnected. And that's generated an incredible burst of energy. How much energy? In a matter of minutes, the sun will produce as much energy as we can produce in all of our power plants on this planet in a million years. For the sun, that's just weather. The magnetic field has reached out into the 2 million degree hot corona. It's cooling the gas, and this gas is streaming back onto the surface. Now, NASA has, for your pleasure, just thrown in some music in the background. The music is not from the sun in this case, but I want you to watch this and just watch the surface of the sun and watch the way it seethes. The sun is just seething with sound and storms way beyond anything you've ever experienced in a thunderstorm here. This movie is sped up by 360 times. One second equals six minutes, and it is spectacularly beautiful. It's the sun like you perhaps have never seen it before. So with that, that's what causes the sun to vibrate. And this is a cutaway of the sun with one of these oscillation modes. And when I tell you that the core of the sun has a temperature of 15 million degrees, when I tell you the core of the sun, even though it's only gas, pure gas, it has a density of 155 grams per cubic centimeter. 
eight times denser than any gold you may be wearing in jewelry here on the earth. Those are not numbers just calculated. Those aren't numbers made up. We can see that. We see it with the sound as we probe deep into the stars to understand their interiors, their lives, how they're born and they live and they die with astro seismology. It is really the music of the spheres. It's back in science. And with that, I've left at least 15 minutes now. I'm going to stop and we'll go to the question time. Thanks for your attention, everybody. And let me stop sharing here. I'm going to try. Andre, have I stopped sharing? Yes, thank you very okay, much, good. Don, for this very fascinating uh, talk. Uh, and I see the first question arrived uh, from AC from California. Would the metallicity of a star affect its density temperature sufficiently to influence its acoustic properties? Oh, the answer is AC, definitely yes. Um, even a small change in the chemical composition gives us changes in the oscillation frequencies. But let me give you some extreme examples. There are stars that late in their lives shed their outer atmospheres and leave behind a star that is made almost of pure helium. And their frequencies are very different than if they were made of the much more common hydrogen that they were originally made of, but which they shed into space. We can see those chemical composition differences in the sound frequencies very well. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, I, I wanted to ask a, a question myself about this uh, Bach uh, prelude uh, over there. Uh, can you just uh, say a bit more words? Because it was a short period of time, so maybe not everyone. It, it, well, it was to der Herr Jesu Christ. Um, but how did he create that? He took the frequency response of that big star. And for that, the overtones on the string, remember it was two to one, three to one, and so on. In the star, they're not exactly harmonic. And if you've got a very good ear, you might have heard that that sound was just a little bit off. Now, he chose that star to be fairly pleasing to the ear. You can choose other stars to make sounds, and they just sound awful. They're not harmonic at all, and it's very, very grating on the ear. If you go to, if you saw Zoltan's name there, Zoltan Kolat, K-O-L-L-A-T-H, if you put his name into Google, put in Zoltan Kolak, Kolak, Stellar Music, you can go to his website, you can get that movie, you can get the music, and he and his composer friend have published papers where they describe how they made the compositions in terms of musical theory and the way classical music is put together. And you can get a complete explanation of that from him. Just remember his name, Zoltan Kolak, A-T-H, Stellar Music. You can find his website, his animations. You can listen to the music. You can read about how they made it. Thank you, Don. Uh, now there is a, a question from John Levenhall. Uh, did you mention earlier, Don, that the majority of stars in the Orion uh, graphic were red dwarfs? Are these very common? Oh, um, John, the answer to that, I did mention that, but I didn't mean to imply that it was only in the direction of Orion. This is true for the entire universe. The vast majority of stars that are born in the universe are born as red dwarfs. They're much, much more common than the more massive stars. So our sun, which is 10 times the mass of the smallest red dwarf, is it, its kind of star is much less common than the red dwarfs. And the really massive, bright blue stars that can have a mass up to 100 times the mass of the sun, they're exceedingly rare. Now, they're incredibly bright, so we do see them out there, but they're very rare. So if you look at what we call the, the, the mass function for stars, most of them are red dwarfs, and then they become less and less and less common as you go to higher and higher masses. True throughout the galaxy by implication throughout the universe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, now a question from Anthony Bloxham. Uh, do you know, it, it's kind of related to, I think, uh, your previous uh, chart. Do you know, uh, can you tell us anything about the recordings, the voyages made of the planets and which NASA released as CDs? Oh, that's a good, that did come from the previous Astro Chat. And um, Anthony, I'm not actually remembering whether they put any sounds of the planets. I do know they put on Holst's, the planets, his composition. But that, I mean, that was classically composed. Um, if there were other sounds on there, I don't remember that now. I was paying close attention to Voyager when it was launched. 
1977. And I did prepare that talk for you last month, but I don't remember all the details. Uh, can I ask you please to just, uh, you can get that recording. You can listen to the whole thing if you like. Go look for the golden record. And if, if I remember later, I might go back and look at that for you, but I can't answer your question specifically now. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, now there is a question from Timur. Uh, has someone recorded sounds of black holes and is it theoretically possible because of the gravity? All right, Timur, uh, you're one of the ones in the audience who can hear those high frequencies. Um, I think you may be about 15 now. Is that right, Andre? Uh, not yet. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, 14. So you can hear the high frequency. Timur, um, there is now an entire field called sonification. And I was just at an electronic meeting for that last week where we're trying to turn various kinds of science into sounds. Two reasons. Can the human brain detect things in the sounds that we wouldn't see by looking at the, at the data? But also for people who are partially sighted or completely blind now to deal with the science and do science. And that meeting we had last week was with my colleague and friend, Wanda Diaz-Merced, who's a completely blind astronomer, professional researcher. She works through sound. So we can turn into sound many things that aren't necessarily having pressure waves in them. And with the black holes, usually this, you can hear sounds from black holes that are generated by the sonification process, but usually that's done based on the spin of the black hole. So it's the frequency of its rotation rather than sound waves. Nothing can get out of the black hole other than Hawking radiation, but no sounds could get out. And so if you hear sounds of the black hole or sounds of neutron stars, for example, those sounds are made from the spin rate, which has a frequency, and that frequency is turned into sound. Thank you, Don. Uh, now there's a question from Jane Elizabeth Madison. Uh, what was the most unexpected thing you have learned about the structure of stars with this technique? Oh, Jane, we, there are so many things that were unexpected. Uh, there, there are strange things out there and let me answer that particularly um, from my own personal point of view. Uh, over 40 years ago, I was observing from South Africa some of the most peculiar stars in the sky. And in some future Astro Chat, I will talk to you about those. But when we look at their chemical composition, their atmospheres are primarily made out of the rare earths, lanthanum, cerium, neodymium, samarium, gadolinium, presidemium, europium, erbium, thulium, thallium, weird stuff. And they were expected not to pulsate because they have very strong magnetic fields. And I not only discovered they had sounds in them, but much to my surprise, at first not understanding and then figuring out, I found that the sound waves were following the magnetic field, not the rotation of the star. And that had never been seen before. I was able to develop a model for that called the oblique pulsator model. And that is now widely used for understanding stellar pulsations in the presence of magnetic fields. And remarkably, just two years ago, a group of us finally found something I've been looking for for 40 years. I thought that when you have two stars orbiting each other very closely, the tides should stretch them out of shape and the pulsation should be along the tidal axis, which points at the other star. And we found those just two years ago. We also, much to our surprise, something we just didn't expect. We found a star with the, with those Kepler data that was going blip, blip, blip every 42 days. And at first we just thought, what is that? Never seen anything like it before in our lives. And we eventually found out that it was two stars orbiting each other in a long eccentric orbit, like Halley's Comet going around the sun. And when they passed close to each other, they almost collided. They stretched each other far out of shape. And that's what produced the brightness. And then as they pulled apart, they started wobbling in waves that are caused by tides. And we now have a complete field of looking at tides and stars with these oscillations. We didn't even know what we were looking at when we saw it. It was a complete surprise. And these surprises come from, it, it's just great fun. They come from all directions. Those stars are now called heartbeat stars. And a previous PhD student of mine, Kelly Hamilton from University of Central Lancashire, is now a faculty member at Villanova University in America. She did her PhD on those stars and is a world expert in them. And yet when she started astronomy only a few years earlier as my uh, undergraduate student, we didn't even know those stars existed. Complete surprise. The universe is full of wonderful surprises. 
Thank you very much, Don. And it's uh, uh, very nice to hear uh, um, about uh, Kelly, uh, whom I remember myself. Uh, then we've been working together with you, University of Central Lancashire. Uh, I, I still remember her in her first year. Um, this question from uh, uh, JZ. I found your study fascinating. Are there sound recordings available to public? Who owns the copyright of the sound recordings of the stars? I'm a musician. Who would I contact to use the stars' sounds? Okay, the, um, there are some sonifications of star sounds available on a variety of websites. Um, at the moment, I'm just thinking that if you look up astroseismology and find, uh, I think there's a NASA website from the Global Oscillation Network Group Solar Telescope where you can find some sounds. I know with Zoltan Kolot, he hasn't copyrighted those, and I think he's quite happy for anybody to use them. If you found sounds on his website, he's very congenial. Send him an email and just ask for permission, and I'm sure you'll be given those. You'll be given permission. A variety of people have been using those for working with music and doing musical compositions, and I don't know of any astronomer anywhere in the world who has tried copywriting those and keeping people from using them. They're all public access. That thumpada dumpada thumpada dumpada you were listening to from the Red Giant um, was a sound that was uh, put in the public domain through the European Southern Observatory by Connie Arch, the professor from Leuven. And amusingly, she told me that a few weeks after that they had made that sound public, she found the young people in Belgium and Leuven uh, dancing to that in the pubs. <laughs> they were using it for dance music. And some people have used it for ringtones. Uh, I think you don't have any problem. I, I'm sorry I can't immediately just give you some specific websites, but if you find those, either just use them or ask somebody and they'll tell you, sure, you can use it. It's all very congenial, very um, collegial. Thank you, Don. Uh, uh, JZ asked to spell the name. I think we can put it uh, as reply in a chart later on. Uh, uh, let us go a couple of minutes. JZ, sorry, was he asking why it was Astero rather than Astro? Was that the question? Uh, just to spell the, oh, spell his the name. Oh, for Zoltan Kolak, we can put that on. We can put that yeah. online. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. And, and there is question from Williams Culture. Uh, how do physical vibrations interact with stars' magnetic fields? Do the magnetic fields then modify vibrations? Oh, the answer is very much so. Uh, particular in the outer atmosphere of the star, where the vibrations become at first magnetoacoustic, acoustic meaning sound wave, partly magnetic wave, and then high in the atmosphere becomes almost a pure alt wave or magnetic wave. And the physics of that is very, very complicated and difficult. There have been quite a few PhDs by some very smart people, particularly my colleague Margarita Cunha in Porto in Portugal, and then her students. Um, Douglas Goff at Cambridge, working on that problem of the magnetic vibrations high in the atmosphere. We're learning much from those, but we still have much to learn because the problem is mathematically very difficult. And that makes it interesting. The challenge is always interesting. Thank you, Don. Uh, you mentioned in your talk that biology was your uh, kind of first passion uh, before uh, uh, astrophysics and astronomy. And there is actually a question more in the biology field from Sophie. And I often can hear bats in my garden. Do you know what type of bats make this low frequency I would be able to hear? Okay, Sophie, first of all, I don't know where your garden is. I don't know what country you're in. Um, it, depending on where you live in the world, you'll have different species of bats. There are many, but I can't answer your question. All of those bats have got high frequency calls where almost all of the frequency is too high for us to hear, but the frequency is over a wide range and you're hearing the lowest frequency bit of the bat sound. And so much like I just said, Timur, who's 14 years old, can hear high frequencies. When he hears something in the environment, his high frequencies, he hears a different, he has a different experience to what I hear because I've lost my high frequencies. And so you and I have a very different experience to what the bat has because it can hear all the frequencies it's putting out. We just hear the low frequency end. And that'll be different from bat species to bat species. And not all bat species echolocate. The big ones like the flying foxes, if you happen to be um, calling me from Sydney where the parks are full of these big flying foxes, 
Um, they don't actually echolocate at all. I strongly suspect they can communicate with each other, but they probably do that in the audible. Uh, I don't actually know the answer to that for the bats that echo, sorry, that don't echolocate, but just talk to each other audibly. Yes, Sophie replied that she's from United Kingdom. Uh -huh. So, um, Sophie, I do not know the exact species that you're listening to, but you and I can both go look up bat species. I think they're Pipistrella is the genus. Um, we can both go look up after the talk to find out how many bat species there are in the United Kingdom, but there's more than one. Uh, look for them when you go out. You'll find they're in different sizes. It's not just one kind of bat in your garden. Do you have a, by the way, I'm, I can't, you can't answer my question, but I hope you've got a bat box if you like bats. Put up a bat box so they'll come nest in your garden. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And uh, I see that uh, our time uh, um, now arrived uh, until its end. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, Don again for this very fascinating talk. Uh, and Sophie just replied, I will get a bad box. Thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> good. good. Uh, uh, and then John oh, Levenhall okay. types that there are 18 species of bats in the United Kingdom. Thank you, John. And Andre, since you are sitting there right in front of Lincoln Cathedral, I suspect that that's one of the world's big bat boxes behind you there. <laughs> yes, definitely is. Yes. Uh, I'd like to, uh, to thank uh, everyone who came, who participated in our uh, chat with questions. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, we uh, uh, we would like to send uh, uh, seasonal greetings uh, to everyone uh, in this uh, time of the year, and we will uh, meet again in, in our future astro charts, uh, uh, discuss another uh, fascinating astrophysics and astronomy issues. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good evening from me, and good day to you over in North America. Thank you.